International bribery is big business. And in just the past four years, some of Britain's best-known firms have faced bribery charges across the world, including big companies like GlaxoSmithKline and even publishers like Macmillan Education. In all, British firms have now paid over £4 billion in fines and settlements to British and American authorities for foreign bribery or bribery-related actions. Some British companies were masters of bribery. Successive governments have encouraged it. And it's been going on for years. We've been successfully exporting bribery for the last 40 or 50 years. Uh, and we have been very good at it. Uh, and it's become a really bad habit. <laughs> This is Ian Foxley. He's a retired paratroop officer and military signals expert. Two years ago, he took a job with a British defense contractor here in the Faisalia Tower in Riyadh, capital of Saudi Arabia, to manage a two billion pound program with the Saudi National Guard. Today, the Serious Fraud Office is conducting a criminal investigation into allegations he's made that his firm and the British Ministry of Defense were involved in bribing Saudi Arabian officials. The company is owned by European defense giant EADS, whose merger talks with Britain's BAE systems have just collapsed. The company are buying and allocating vehicles to Saudi public officials. You have to question <laughs> whether those are bribes or whether those are um, well, it's not normal for a commercial company to allocate high-grade Range Rovers and Land Cruisers to public officials. Tonight, for the first time, he explains his allegations on television and in an unprecedented investigation, drawing on court records, legal documents and internal company memos, this programme can now tell the story of Britain's often uneasy relationship with bribery around the world. Fort Dix, New Jersey. Two miles down this road, a British citizen is serving a 21-month sentence in a US federal penitentiary. Jeffrey Tesla practiced law in Tottenham, North London, from a small shop near the market. He arranged bribes through a company in Gibraltar for the biggest ever corrupt contract in Nigeria, worth nearly $6 billion, to a consortium led by the American firm Kellogg, Brown and Root to build Nigeria's first and biggest ever liquefied natural gas factory here at Bonny Island. Jeffrey Tesler, who, who I personally like very much, I think he's a very, very nice, kind man, a good family man, found himself in trouble because he was indicted in, in federal court in Houston, Texas. New York-based Brad Simon is Tesla's lawyer. The allegations in the indictment were that Jeffrey was uh, making illegal payments on behalf of the, uh, the consortium uh, to Nigerian officials. They claimed he was acting, in their words, as the bagman for this project. So why did they hire Tesla to do their dirty work? Over the years, he developed some expertise with respect to Nigeria. He'd only been there once, but he had many, many contacts. When Nigerian officials would come to London, they would invariably meet with Jeffrey. He knew the players in Nigeria. He knew who would be expecting payments, where the money needed to go, to facilitate this project. In Nigeria, some take a slightly different view of Tesla. Jeffrey Tesla, serially, from the right top, 
the head of government down to the last man, he corrupted everybody. Tesla understood that if you wanted to give these bribes, you're not going to give to lower operatives, you really have to go and uh, identify the kinds of people you need to give because then there will be no problem. Dapo Olorunyomi was chief of staff of Nigeria's Economic and Financial Crime Commission. This man just grabbed the Nigerian state by the throat and made sure that he funneled money dollars through the whole process. On March 20th this year, in a federal court in Houston, Texas, Jeffrey Tesla was convicted. Jeffrey pled guilty to um, uh, uh, two counts in the indictment, and he agreed to forfeit $131 million in, in uh, proceeds. Excuse me, you agreed to what? To forfeit $131 million U.S. dollars. Where did Jeffrey Tesla get $131 million uh, U.S. He, dollars? He was paid that money uh, by, by the four corporate, four members of the consortium. One reason many get away with such massive bribery is that the financial transactions tend to take place outside the countries involved, through international banks and offshore tax havens, and financial centers like London and Switzerland. Nuhu Rabadu was the head of Nigeria's Economic and Financial Crime Commission. We attempted to investigate in Nigeria, but it wasn't possible because all the transactions took place outside Nigeria. The payments were not made in Nigeria. There were no papers, no documents whatsoever to follow. So, the Nigerian Crime Commission asked the Americans for help. I finally decided to come to Washington and I met with the Justice Department. And the US authorities took up the matter and they investigated and they brought a lot of them to justice. The man in charge of prosecutions, such as Tesla's, is U.S. Assistant Attorney General Lanny Brewer. If you're engaged in bribing a foreign official and you or your company have any nexus at all to the United States, then we have jurisdiction, we have an ability to prosecute you. So you could be a foreign company bribing a foreign official in another part of the world but if you have a business in the United States, you're traded in the United States, or you use the United States somehow as part of your scheme, then we're able to reach your conduct. And when we can prove the case against you, we will in fact prosecute you for foreign bribery. Bribing foreign government officials has been a crime under US law for 35 years, since Congress passed the Foreign Corrupt Practices Act in 1977. I think a British businessman ought to still be very worried about that FCPA there in Washington. Jeffrey Tesler had never heard of it when he was conducting this, uh, making these payments in Nigeria. It, it, the fact that this statue was on the books meant nothing to him. He, did, it was, it, he was completely unaware of it. Over the past 20 years, many Western and other countries worldwide have adopted modern anti-bribery laws that cover payments abroad but until 2011, not Britain. There's been this very cynical sense that there isn't any way to proceed without paying bribes. It's the way that it's done. And if we want to be successful, we're going to have to participate in bribery. December 14th, 2006. Britain's Labour government announced the Serious Fraud Office was abandoning its investigation into bribery involving BAE Systems, Britain's largest defence company, over a contract to sell fighter planes to Saudi Arabia. I don't believe the investigation is standing will have led anywhere except to the complete wreckage of a vital strategic relationship for our country. Called the Al Yamama contract and worth £43 billion over 20 years, it's the biggest British arms deal ever. The decision to stop the investigation caused outrage among Britain's top anti-bribery lawyers. British Aerospace case confirmed the opinion of most of the rest of the world, particularly corrupt regimes around the world, that the British were exporting bribery 
in a large way. It looked to the anti-bribery community as if the, the, the British did not have the political will to proceed against a, a British company, a particularly a, a, you know, a, a large and important British company. Historically, British governments actually helped British firms to bribe. In the early 70s, it became the habit that ambassadors in certain parts of the world, they were supposed to find the right people to bribe in the government in order to get the business. At a cabinet meeting in May 1977 to discuss slush money, industry minister Eric Varley told his colleagues that some 10% of British overseas business involved practices which we would normally consider improper in this country. Prime Minister James Callaghan replied saying that it might be more difficult for the UK to accept as high standards as the Americans. In those days, payments for bribery were tax deductible. They were usually recorded as expenses. Jeff Kay worked in the defense industry until the late 90s. My first job really as a managing director, I made a tour of Africa. It was the most eye-opening tour of my life. I was in a general's office and he said, I want to tell you a story about when I was young, I have a brother, and my father always used to give my brother sweets. I never got any sweets. He looked at me with piercing eyes and said, I now want my sweets. We had, of course, been talking about the contract that we were hoping to sign in Kenya. At BAE Systems, exports were booming. After the £43 billion contract to Saudi Arabia came aircraft contracts worth £1.5 billion with Hungary, the Czech Republic and other countries. But in 2002, a problem arose. On July 19th, a meeting was held here at the State Department in Washington. The British delegation was led by Sir Kevin Tebbit, permanent secretary at the Ministry of Defense. The meeting was to discuss US concerns about allegations that BAE um, was engaged in bribery. Mr. Tebbit uh, suggested that um, BAE could not have engaged in any kind of illicit activity because he had the personal assurance of the chairman of the company that BAE had not done anything like that. I said that I had, uh, had been in a room that was full of documentation of activities of BAE and that I had doubts as to the representation that was being made. The documentation had to do with payments to a minister of another country at the time of a BAE fighter deal. Sir Kevin then referred to a letter written by that country's head of state saying that the payments had been approved and they were therefore not bribery. At that point I said, well, Perhaps so, but that letter was dated after payments were made. And he had no answer to that. And very soon after that, he left the meeting. The MOD on behalf of Sir Kevin says that he made clear that if the Americans believed there was substance to the allegations, this would be of serious concern. And he asked them to present specific evidence, but nothing was forthcoming. Two years later, the British government instructed the Serious Fraud Office to investigate BAE's Al Yamama contract with Saudi Arabia. Britain still didn't have a foreign bribery act, but two sections added to the Anti-Terrorism Act after 9-11 now made it possible to prosecute British firms for bribery overseas. Matthew Cowie was the case officer. In the BAE case, we started with something very small, an allegation about a travel agent making certain payments or meeting certain expenses for Saudi royals. 
Um, but that was only the tip of the, the iceberg. Um, there were more than two million documents in total. And uh, we looked at the documents, which are all in boxes, and, uh, and just thought, well, wh where do you start with this? Soon, serious fraud office investigators uncovered evidence of a complex network of massive commissions and irregular payments. On December 14, 2006, the Saudi case is dropped. Continuation of the investigation would cause serious damage to UK-Saudi security, intelligence and diplomatic cooperation, which is likely to have seriously negative consequences for the United Kingdom public interest. Fed up by now, the US Justice Department launched its own investigation. In February 2010, BAE Systems pleaded guilty to conspiring to make false statements to US authorities in connection with regulatory filings and undertakings about Saudi, Czech and Hungarian contracts. The company was fined $400 million. It has always denied bribery. In London, BAE admitted to accounting irregularities with respect to a small contract in Africa. The penalty paid was very small indeed, and when the judge finally passed a fine of half a million pounds, it was a grave disappointment to the serious fraud office. BAE says that it's never been charged with bribery, that it has systematically enhanced its compliance policies and processes, and continues to work hard to have robust anti-bribery policies in place. In April 2010, Britain got its first ever Overseas Bribery Act. It came into effect on July 1st last year. To celebrate, Trace International, a US-based anti-bribery organization, held a reception for British businessmen at the Tower of London. When we asked them, which law is going to keep you up at night? The US Foreign Corrupt Practices Act, the FCPA, or the UK Bribery Act? And over 80% of them indicated that they're still more frightened by the US law and enforcement of the US law against British companies than they are uh, about the British, the British law. Trace International keeps the most complete, up-to-date public database on bribery cases worldwide, including Britain. There's a very strong sense that the US law is being prosecuted with increasing enthusiasm, that their team is well-trained. They have the FBI unit able to travel the world investigating these cases. Now, by comparison, the UK has a much smaller team, a new director, there doesn't seem to be political will. There was really an extraordinary debate in the UK around the implementation of the UK Bribery Act about rolling it back, uh, about watering it down, which gave the world the impression that we weren't going to see the same pace of prosecution. What does this mean for Britain? In recent years, over two dozen British companies have either been convicted or paid settlements following allegations of bribery or a lack of controls to prevent it. Among them in London, Aon Insurance, sponsors of Manchester United, fined £5 million by Britain's Financial Services Authority for not taking reasonable care to establish systems to counter the risks of bribery in relation to business in Bahrain, Bangladesh, Bulgaria, Burma, Indonesia and Vietnam. Willis Insurance again fined by the FSA for similar behavior in Egypt and Russia. Smith and Nephew avoided prosecution by paying $22 million as part of a settlement to resolve allegations by American authorities that it had bribed Greek hospital doctors. The company neither admitted nor denied them. On the South Bank, Shell Oil agreed to pay settlements totaling $48 million in respect to allegations that bribes were paid by its subcontractors to Nigerian customs officials. Out on the M4, GlaxoSmithKline was fined $3 billion in fines and civil liabilities, in part for payments to doctors to prescribe its drugs. The firm denies providing bribes to doctors. And in Oxford, 
Macmillan Education and Oxford University Press both admitted in connection with civil proceedings that their representatives bribed African officials to buy their textbooks. In Scotland, Diageo, makers of Johnny Walker whiskey, paid a $16 million settlement rather than face prosecution over allegations its subsidiaries bribed Indian, Thai and South Korean officials and military officers. And in Aberdeen, oil and gas industry supplier Vetco Gray found guilty of paying over $3 million in bribes to Nigerian officials between 2002 and 2005. What's striking is that all but one of these companies was first investigated in the United States or by other governments and international organizations. What I say to British executives who want to bribe foreign officials, you may get away with it. I may not get the evidence. I may not learn about it. But if I do learn about it, if our FBI learns about it, if our other agencies learn about it, you absolutely need to lose sleep at night that you may be held responsible and that you might go to jail. To avoid a ferocious FBI and Justice Department investigation, firms are encouraged to self-report their suspect activities. If you're a company that is engaged in bribing of a foreign official, you come in and you tell the Department of Justice before we know about it that we will treat you in a more lenient manner. And if you don't tell us, and that we ultimately find out about it, that you know that we're going to treat you in a far less lenient manner. But self-investigation's not for the faint-hearted. Los Angeles, California. Corporate gateway to the expanding markets of China and the rest of Asia. Also home to a growing number of forensic lawyers hired by companies to investigate possible bribery in their overseas businesses. Like former Marine lawyer Aaron Murphy. Investigations uh, can involve a variety of different, um, different techniques. One is, is uh, I, I sort of refer to as the, uh, as the Dawn Raid, for example. It's sort of the closest uh, private practitioners get to uh, doing what people are familiar with, you know, the FBI kind of knocking on the door. You will show up unannounced, and you immediately fan out and begin to try to gather as much evidence as you can uh, in the shortest amount of time possible. They'll be imaging computers, they'll be making copies of, of, of records. That is the, the technique that you use when you have a high degree of concern that uh, evidence may disappear very quickly. The other type of technique, and it, it is the undercover kind of uh, 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 you know, spy uh, operation, if you will, where you believe that people are currently engaging in, in transactions uh, that are improper that you believe you can investigate without them knowing what you're doing. That sort of technique um, is, is analogous to, uh, you, you know, agents sitting in the van, you know, listening to wiretaps, those kinds of things. So why would a law firm that's been hired by a company be so thorough in digging up the drains about possible bribery by that company? If you conceal facts, and if you hide the ball, I mean, you know, you might get away with that for a while, but at some point you're not gonna, because the government has a lot of other sources of information that you're not privy to. And so, if, you know, if you if you represent, hey, look, these are all the emails to from executives A, B, and C, and gee, there's look, there's nothing here, and in fact, you've concealed something, and they have those documents from someone else, you know, it's game over. Corporations, regardless of where they're at, only have something to fear from the FCPA and the FBI when they are trying to cover up conspiratorial activity or trying to conceal conduct at a uh, more senior executive level. The FBI will then uh, expand the investigation beyond uh, what maybe it was initially in the cooperative manner into a more, uh, into a more compulsive type investigation where we may compel testimony, uh, subpoena financial records, 
and we'll look for, uh, again, for inconsistencies that might, uh, that might suggest criminality on the part of these senior executives. So how do we in Britain deal with allegations that British companies have bribed overseas? The Serious Fraud Office deals with lots of cases that are never made public. We don't know what arrangements it has reached with the companies involved. The details of the cases it has made public are often sketchy, but they do give some indication. Here's an example. North America, South America, Africa, the maybe group of companies. On this year's Sunday Times Rich List, number 281, David Maybe and his family, major shareholders of Britain's largest privately owned bridge building firm, with a family fortune estimated at 282 million pounds. Over the last 15 years, the Maybe group have built such a reputation for overseas sales that they have repeatedly been honored by the Queen's Award for Industry and Export Achievements. The Maybe and Johnson case was the very first UK prosecution, corporate prosecution for corruption. Until seven years ago, the company, founded by his father, and for which David Maybe was sales director, was bribing foreign officials across the globe. How did they do it? It was actually quite simple. Um, they had commission agents. They had agents locally uh, in the countries in which they worked. Um, they were paid a percentage, partly for legitimate services, assisting the exporter locally in the market. But they also pr provided a certain amount of money for bribes, and they recorded them. Uh, so in the internal ledgers of the company, there were um, named public officials uh, who were the recipients of bribes. This prestigious building is the headquarters of the Maybe Group of Companies at Twyford, Berkshire, England. In 2010, the company pleaded guilty to bribery in Ghana and Jamaica, two small markets where it sold about £42 million worth of bridges several years earlier. But Maybe and Johnson wasn't prosecuted over its business in the Philippines. Here, the company built over 1,000 bridges, Millions of people benefited from these new structures, its website claims. But there was a public complaint to the Philippine ombudsman about many of them, called Bridges to Nowhere, built over what appeared to be dry creeks, where they would only be used by pedestrians and animals, and even leading to dead ends. The Philippine Senate Committee on Accountability of Public Officers has just opened a new investigation. The Philippine program brought Maybe and Johnson several hundred million pounds worth of sales and accounted for the bulk of the company's income. Maybe's website today features a photo from 2003 of the then Philippines president opening a Maybe bridge with David Maybe standing behind her. If the Philippines was the company's biggest market and there were public complaints about the bridge contracts, why didn't the serious fraud office pursue them? I'm glad you ask about the Philippines because that was part of the investigation. But ultimately, when you have a, a company which has admitted endemic corruption, the offences that were prosecuted, i.e. Jamaica and Ghana, amply demonstrates the, the same practices over and over again. The company had already appointed new directors in 2008 and was fined £4.6 million. Maybe Bridges had 800 people working for it in the UK. That's important to any prosecutor. And actually, in Maybe Johnson, I think they paid uh, the appropriate price. No company director, including David Maybe, was charged. David Maybe eventually spent a few months in jail following conviction in a separate case for paying kickbacks to Saddam Hussein's regime for some four million pounds worth of bridges sold to Iran. In this case, the family holding company paid back 131,201 pounds. The serious fraud office described it as the final act 
in an exemplary model of corporate self-reporting and cooperative resolution. Is this the light touch of regulation or just dues for corporate crime? The company says it's decided not to comment. Athens, Greece, once the home of the world's greatest culture. Today, it's destitute, deeply corrupt and deeply in debt. For years, bribing officials has been the way some companies went about winning Greek government contracts. One of those companies is Dupuy International, based here in Leeds. It's owned by the American company Johnson & Johnson, which we know best for baby products. The US Justice Department tipped off the serious fraud office that Dupuy was selling artificial hips and knees in Greece to a distributor who then paid bribes to Greek National Health Service surgeons to order them. Essentially, there was a, a, a Greek a distributor and he would receive commission payments for, uh, for his services and part of those commission payments were being used to, to pay bribes. Dupuy called the bribes Professional Education Payments, or PROFED. Investigative journalist Tassos Taloglu has good contacts with the Greek financial police. There was no education, of course. The doctors either got bribes or trips. This uh, education fee started with something around 15% and uh, it went up to 25 and then 30 percent because there was a competition on bribing, in, especially in the Greek public hospitals. Dupuy's Greek subsidiary is here in Athens. The Greek police uncovered lists of surgeons who appear to have accepted bribes, then seized their bank statements. They went through these accounts knowing that the doctors in the public hospitals were paid normally on the 1st and on the 15th of each month. And on each bigger amount that was not on the 1st and on the 15th of the month, they tried to ask who paid in this money. As the time passed, the doctors realized that they could make more and more money out of that business but the biggest slice went in the pockets of the companies like the Pui that sold that material. This is because Greek hospitals paid up to four times more for the orthopedic appliances than the prices for which they were sold in the rest of Europe. The ultimate losers, the Greek National Health Service and Greek taxpayers. Because of this party that was going on, it's even difficult to find cotton in some hospitals, or paper, or oxygen, because the hospitals today do not have the money to buy that. Last year, Dupuy paid just under five million pounds following a court civil recovery order. The company's marketing director for Greece was convicted and given a suspended sentence. No other executives were charged. But Dupuy and Johnson & Johnson still had to reckon with the US authorities. In January this year, Johnson & Johnson paid a total of $70 million in fines and penalties in relation to its subsidiaries' bribery activities in several European countries, including Greece. Dupuy's British managing director at the time of the bribery publicly accepted ultimate responsibility and resigned. No one's ever going to be prosecuted because they bought somebody a stake. But there's going to be a whole bunch of other behavior that's wrapped around the relationship between the company and the official that's at issue. Bribe payers and bribe takers are getting more creative. We see things, for example, that uh, the company uh, arranges to pay the school fees of the government official, or a scholarship for their child to study in the United States or England, or the sweetheart deal, and this one's very difficult to catch, where the company, through one of their agents typically, buys a very expensive piece of real estate and sells that to the government official far below market value, perhaps 10% of market value. We also hear uh, government officials asking for medical care, 
help with visas. People are still being paid with briefcases full of cash. And that is because it's the closest thing to an untraceable transaction. It's the same lesson drug dealers learned a long time ago. They deal in cash. Riyadh, capital of Saudi Arabia. Two years ago, Ian Foxley accepted a job here as program director for the communications network for the Saudi National Guard. His employer was a company called GPT, the British subsidiary of the giant European defense contractor EADS, whose merger talks with BAE systems have just collapsed. I discovered that there were um, irregular payments going through the company, payments to companies that I didn't think produced product or output to my program. I asked who these companies were and why we were making payments to them. I effectively got told that my job was to run the program, not to ask uh, questions about who we're paying invoices to. Foxley says that payments had to be recommended and approved by the British Ministry of Defence team in Riyadh, which supervised the contract on behalf of the Saudis. So he says he went to the Ministry of Defence team to report his concerns. They said, fine, well, we hear you, but unless you produce some evidence, we can't do anything. So produce the evidence and we'll take it up. The next morning was Friday, December 6, 2010. Foxley went to work early to look through company files to which he did not normally have access. What I found was that there was an extra line in those recommendation papers called bought-in services, which constituted 16% of the program. And I found two additional subcontractors um, who were in the Cayman Islands. He also found emails he believes show the company was providing vehicles to Saudi National Guard officers and officials. It's not normal for a commercial company to allocate high-grade Range Rovers and Land Cruisers to public officials. And he discovered emails he believes show the company was renting property from senior National Guard officers. So what you have is National Guard officers taking rental from the company who are the prime contractor fulfilling the contract at a very high level with extraordinary agents fees. Foxley says he downloaded the relevant documents and emailed them to the MOD team thinking they would get back to him. Instead, I got a call from the managing director asking me to join him in his office and I joined him there. And he said to me, Ian, you've been sending emails to the MOD. And I said, yes. I sent them a couple of emails with some interesting documents on, because I thought they were the appropriate people to, um, to have them. And he said, well, that's theft of company information. In this country, I can have you, I can call the police and have you arrested in jail. And all of a sudden, I realized that I was trapped on the 20th floor of the Faisalia Tower. And so I just walked out of the office. Foxley says he phoned someone he knew well on the MOD team and met that afternoon. We discussed uh, whether I should stay in the country, and their recommendation was, no, get out as fast as possible. And um, they got me out that evening. When Foxley got back to Britain, he immediately reported what he had found. I went to the MOD and I gave them all the evidence. And I then took it to the serious fraud office. Foxley alleges that the British MOD is involved. This is because GPT's contract is actually with the MOD and all expenditure requests are approved by the MOD team in Riyadh and go through its bank account. The part that is played by the UK MOD team is very pertinent to what's going on. The payments cannot be made 
unless the UK MOD are acquiescent to the payments being made. Foxley says this includes the paperwork for what were called bought-in services. The documents which are passed to the UK MOD team designate how much is required per project, what it's required for, and who it's going to. And there's the additional line of bought-in services on that document. A, they see the recommendations for the allocation of funding, and B, they see the invoices at the other end. These are unproven allegations. This August, the Serious Fraud Office announced that it is opening a criminal investigation into allegations concerning GPT and aspects of the conduct of their business in Saudi Arabia. What uh, I and I think the general public are fearful of is another al Yamama, where an investigation is conducted and it's all brushed under the carpet. The MOD says it referred the allegations to the Serious Fraud Office. Both GPT and the MOD say it would be inappropriate to comment now given the ongoing criminal investigation. The Serious Fraud Office says that its policy is that if there is evidence and public interest, it will prosecute. Yet the government also does a lot to set the tone for how British businesses approach bribery. We get the strong sense that for most British companies, it's just going to be business as usual, that they're really not that concerned about prosecution of the new law. Last year, then Justice Minister Ken Clark announced that the official guidance as to how the Bribery Act should be interpreted would be revised. I'm hoping to put out very clear guidance for businesses to save them from, I think, the fears that are sometimes being aroused by the compliance industry. Shortly after, Clark spelled this out in a written statement. Combating bribery is about common sense, not bureaucracy. I do not expect a large number of prosecutions. The guidelines, as they eventually were published, suggested significant softening of the terms of the legislation. A host of things were put in uh, which suggested that it's all right Business as usual is fine. The Ministry of Justice says that the guidance is just guidance to businesses and not the law, and therefore cannot in any way water down the law. It also says it expects effective enforcement of the Bribery Act and for organisations that break it to be taken to court. British companies still have to reckon with the Americans. An amendment to an American law called the Dodd-Frank Act is soon to be implemented that will affect mining oil and gas company operations worldwide in places such as Nigeria. It says if companies are listed in the US, then they will have to make public their payments to foreign governments on a detailed project-by-project -project basis. Shell doesn't like it. Transparency for the sake of transparency is not enough. This is where we at Shell believe that Dot Frank actually fails. For Dot Frank, the highest goal is transparency. There is nothing more. Just this is Peter Voser, Shell's chief executive, speaking at a transparency conference last year. Not only does Dot Frank ignore governments, but some have argued that it may even require companies to disclose information that is prohibited by these, by these country governments. Shell have no reason whatsoever to object or to disagree with this new law. Dark Frank is a hugely important development in the fight against bribery and corruption generally in developing countries. Earlier this year, Shell Nigeria found itself involved in a scandal. It and the Nigerian subsidiary of the Italian National Oil Company paid the Nigerian government over a billion dollars in a settlement for rights to an offshore oil field. What wasn't disclosed, and what the Nigerian press somehow discovered, is that the money was quickly passed on to a company called Malibu. The owner of Malibu appears to be one Danis Hete, uh, a former oil minister who appears to have given himself the oil block and who's also a convicted money launderer. 
Global Witness investigates business between big companies and third world governments and argues for less secrecy. I think the question Shell has to answer is what efforts did they undertake to ensure that the transaction they were involved in wasn't, in a sense, a, a mechanism to forward large amounts of money to key Nigerian government officials. And so far, they have not clarified that. Shell told Exposure that it acted in accordance with Nigerian law and the terms of its agreement with the Nigerian government. Shell says it made no payment to Malibu and that its inspection of Malibu's company records as part of due diligence did not establish any connection between Dana Tete and Malibu. As regards the Dodd-Frank Amendment, Shell says it's in favor of transparency, but any rule that requires companies to violate host country laws is unacceptable and will result in lost business opportunities and harm shareholders. I cannot understand if you are a big company like Shell and that you are occupying such a huge important part of a business of a country, 50% of the oil that is coming out of Nigeria, you are the contractor and you will not want to make it open, you will not want to make it public, you will not want Nigerians to know this their own resources how you are taking it, who you are selling it to, how you are selling it, who are you giving the money back to? And you think that by making it public that it's going to cause problems? In what way? How? Today, there are big questions over how the government and companies will deal with the Bribery Act. Last spring, the then director of the Serious Fraud Office, Richard Alderman, said that the SFO was going after foreign firms that appeared to be winning contracts due to corrupt means at the expense of honest British companies. If the statute comes to be viewed as a tool to um, protect British companies at the expense of foreign companies, I, I don't, that's ultimately probably not a good thing. I still think there's a whole generation of businessmen out there who bribe because they, they can and don't expect any consequence. Will British companies ever give up bribery? Uh, it will happen. It will happen because it'll be four stars. And Exposure continues next Wednesday at 10.35 with a look into life on some of Britain's hardest housing estates.